lot of wonderful chess artifacts in the world, but it's very rare to see so many that are connected in one place. And uh, this evening I'd like to show you some of the high points that Emily has uh, selected to uh, display. And we're going to start over here. And uh, the topic for this evening, uh, uh, Mrs. Piatigorsky, Jacqueline Piatigorsky, she was a woman with very wide interests in the chess world. She was uh, a very fine player. She took uh, second in a U.S. Women's Championship. She played in the uh, U.S. Uh, she represented the United States in the Women's uh, Chess Olympiad. Uh, she was a very prominent organizer. Uh, she was an uh, innovator in uh, designing uh, tournaments so that spectators could enjoy them. But she also had an appreciation for the aesthetic points of the game. And she had a very large and extensive uh, uh, chess set collection. And you can see here in the picture that's from Sports Illustrated magazine uh, just a couple of the many, many sets that she had. And there's two that are here on display. I think they're both quite beautiful. I particularly like this one over here on the right. It was very nice and sparkly. And uh, uh, also I, what I like about the set is that it looks like one that you could, even though it's very artistic, you could actually play on it because the pieces are very well proportioned. You can easily de you know, see at a glance you know, what it's upon, what is a knight. Oftentimes on very uh, beautiful sets. They're beautiful, but you know, they're not very functional. She was a late bloomer. Unlike uh, today when many people learn when they're kids, uh, she didn't learn uh, until later in life. And uh, she uh, first started playing uh, correspondence chess, chess by mail, if you will. And that was very common uh, in the days before, you know, when there were you know, more chess clubs, more tournaments. People would you know, play their opponents. And what you see here uh, is a, uh, a tool that would allow you to uh, keep a record of your game so you wouldn't have to reset the pieces each time your opponent's move would uh, arrive. This uh, sort of recorder would hold up to maybe a half dozen to a dozen games and you could uh, uh, you know, have the position set up at, at the point where the game had uh, broken up and then when your new move comes in you just put it on your little board there and you could analyze it. Now if we come over here you'll see the person that was most instrumental in helping Mrs. Piatigorsky, uh, helping her to really uh, become a real chess enthusiast. And the fellow on the right here is uh, Herman Steiner. And I would say that he's arguably the, the greatest chess promoter in the history of, of, of the game in the United States. He uh, was very active in uh, Hollywood. He got a lot of Hollywood celebrities like Humphrey Bogart to come to his tournaments. He got uh, uh, Spencer Tracy. Uh, there were many. And he just had a natural uh, instinct for uh, getting a lot of attention for the game and he really was a really warm and friendly person and he just uh, got really excited about the game and uh, you can see here there uh, on a TV program in Los Angeles typical thing for him to do to try to bring chess into the public eye. The next two uh, photos over here uh, Jacqueline was a very quick learner and she played in the US Championship in 1951 and to put that in perspective, she had started playing in the late 40s correspondence chess. So in just a few years, she was ready to play in the U.S. Women's Championship. And it's not often you can look at a photo like this and have a chance to actually go 50 years later, actually 60 years in this case, uh, and see and sit in the same booth. But if you went to the Marshall Chess Club in New York, uh, uh, not too far from Washington Square Park, you could uh, pose for these same pictures yourself. And in these, you can see she's playing here on the right against uh, uh, Willa Owen, Owens from Ohio. The woman on the left, though, uh, bears a little more comment, and her name was uh, Nancy Roos, and uh, she was uh, from Belgium, originally from uh, Germany. Uh, she was a participant in the U.S. Women's Championships, but what really uh, brought her to the public eye was she was a really great photographer, and uh, quite a few of the uh, photos that you're going to see this evening uh, and perhaps in future exhibits at the uh, World Chess Hall of Fame were taken by her. She, uh, she was technically very good, but she also had a really artistic eye. And I, I especially like these two trophies. The one uh, on the right here is uh, one she won for winning a brilliancy prize in the uh, U.S. Women's Championship in 51. And one thing I really like about these trophies is that uh, unlike the ones today, they really look nice. You know, they're made out of like wood and they have different uh, 
uh, they have an artistic design to them and uh, uh, the ones that are present that are awarded today are usually more ma mass manufactured and not quite as uh, selective. Uh, the photo over here is one of my favorites uh, and I like it because you can, you can sort of see a lot of things going on in just one image. And if you look over here, uh, I don't know if any of you have a chance to uh, take a peek here. You'll see uh, Mrs. Pietrzykorski, she's uh, hot in the, in the middle of the action, and she's playing against Mona May Karf. And many of the women that played in the U.S. Women's Championships in the 1950s uh, especially, they really were uh, individuals that were quite accomplished and, and really quite remarkable. In the case of Mona May Karf, she was a uh, 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 successful businesswoman. She had uh, uh, traded on Wall Street uh, for several decades uh, quite successfully. She was a U.S. women's champion. She spoke six languages, you know, quite, quite, quite a person, I would say. Now, over here, uh, you're going to see a couple photos, and one of them on the left was taken by Nancy Roos, and this is of uh, her playing against her good friend, Lena Grimet. And uh, the two of them were really instrumental in supporting uh, chess in Southern California. They were both involved in the Fischer-Rushevsky match. I mean, some of you have maybe heard of Bobby Fischer, I hope. And Sammy Rushevsky, that was like a really, really big match in 1961. And they were the ones uh, that did much of the promotional work for that. And in the center here, you see a letter from uh, Sammy Rushevsky. And I'd alluded to uh, Mr. Steiner before being the person that really got her interested in chess. Well, unfortunately, he died very suddenly and, uh, in his early 50s. And so she was looking for another chess teacher. And after the fischer rushevsky match, uh, she made the connection with Sammy. And he became her chess teacher, but never on the quite l the same level, uh, the same sort of relationships that she had with uh, Steiner. It was a more formal uh, situation. Uh, but the thing that's interesting here is that you get this letter from Rushevsky, who was one of the two great American players of the 1960s, along with Fischer. And both of them uh, tried to become professional players in the 1960s. And that was really, really difficult. There were really few opportunities uh, to be a professional player in those days. And so both of them were uh, uh, very grateful for the patronage that Mrs. Pietrzykorski, you know, she tournament opportunities. Uh, she uh, supported Ruszewski and Fisher in many, many different events, including and up to uh, uh, Fisher's World Championship uh, uh, run. She was one of the sort of major behind-the-scenes players. One thing about Mrs. Uh, Piotrgorski, she never really liked to be in the limelight, and so Jacqueline would always uh, kind of step back, but if she hadn't been in the picture, a lot of the things that came, came out, I mean, I, I wonder, like, if Fisher were going to see a tournament that he played in, if he hadn't played in that tournament, I'm not sure if he would have ever actually played a match for the World Championship. So let's come and take a look over here now. And how many of you know Larry Christensen? Multiple U.S. Champion, champion winner. A guy when he was 12 years old was like about six foot two. Uh, one of the few uh, U.S. champions ever to have uh, been a semi-pro water polo player. Big guy. Well, one of the nice things ab about Mrs. Pietrzygorski is that she kept everything, and I mean everything. And uh, what we have over here is a letter that Larry Christensen wrote when he was like 14 years old, which is like, you know, 40 years ago. And he's thanking Mrs. Pietrzygorski for sponsoring him to go to the uh, National uh, High School Chess Championship. And besides sponsoring U.S. championships and U.S. women's championships and sending players to interzonals and U.S. student teams and all these, you know, major sort of big scale events, she also uh, would look after the little people, if you will. And many uh, kids uh, would write to her and, and teenagers and college students, and they would want to go to some important chess competition. And they would ask you know, for like $50 or $100 or maybe more sometimes, too. And she invariably would uh, send them the money. And uh, uh, this case, uh, you know, it was Larry Christensen. And you know, things like that were very important you know, in encouraging a young player like that to keep going. He really appreciated the fact that you know, he had somebody that was, was supporting him. So I, I always like to see this letter here. Now over on this side, uh, we move forward in time. And the letter from Christensen was back in the early 1970s. But these are two letters that were written in the early 80s. And this was close to the time that uh, Mrs. Piedgorski 
uh, was starting to wind up her uh, Jessica Ferris. By the way, she lived to be 100, and she died in 2012. And these are two letters from uh, Bruce Pandolfini and Lev Albert. Uh, Pandolfini, some of you might remember, was in Searching for Bobby Fischer. He was the teacher of Josh Waitzkin. And uh, he was uh, very grateful to Mrs. Piotrgorski for helping to help, uh, help him put on some training camps for young players. And Lev Albert was like a multiple US champion. So if you were to make a list of all the people that Mrs. Piotrgorski uh, reached out to, I mean, Jacqueline, she just, I mean, it'd be, it'd be in the hundreds, if not thousands. Now, over on your right here, you'll see uh, a picture with uh, two players uh, facing off. And one of them is Lastimil Horde, uh, formerly of the Czechoslovakia, and on the right is the late Leonid Stein of uh, the Soviet Union. And Stein was uh, one of the great talents of the chess world that was taken much too early. He was a three-time Soviet champion, and he didn't make it to 40. He died of the occupational disease of chess players of the past. And what do you think that might be? Uh, that would have he would have he would have survived past 39, but that's not a bad one. They are they they would not throw away a chocolate bar if you tossed it at them. No, uh, chess a lot of chess players in the past they used to smoke a lot to try to relieve the stress of tournament play. And I remember when I first started playing, my parents were horrified that I had become a chain smoker overnight because my clothing reeked of it, my hair reeked of it, my teeth reeked of it, everything smoky, smoky, smoky. But in the case of Stein, he was you know. That was the way to deal with the stress at the board, and he was a chain smoker, and uh, he didn't get much exercise, and he liked to eat a lot of tasty things that weren't good for him, and uh, he left us much too early. And so the two of them are playing in this uh, three-man playoff uh, to determine who would get to go to play in the candidates' matches. And if you look up above, you'll see there's a clock that's in the right, upper right-hand corner, but there's also a chess clock at the board, and then down below it, there are like all these wires. And up until uh, the 1966 Piatigorsky Cup, the standard practice at tournaments was that you would have uh, what they would call a wall boy. And that's what the young man is in the back there. And that young man in the back is actually just retired from a job from the, Saint, uh, from the Santa Cruz Public Library. It's Grandmaster James Tarjan. But he was 15 years old when this picture was taken. And his job is just to make sure that nothing's going wrong. He doesn't really have to do too much because the clock is synchronized with the clock, the chess clock, because they have them plugged into the wall together. And nowadays, you know, if you went over to watch any of the tournaments uh, across the street, uh, this would seem pretty primitive. But it was like cutting edge technology when it happened. Up to that point, they would have somebody just manually move the clock with their hand every 15, 20 minutes. And also, you'll notice behind the players, there's what looks like a projector. And in fact, that's what it is. And uh, when you have a large amount of people watching games, as they did in the 66 Piatigorsky Cup with like 900 people, it's almost impossible to have a venue that would allow all of them to see it. So she had this idea after 1963 to put in a, uh, a big uh, uh, projector system that would allow all the players in the tournament, uh, spectators and, and players that were uh, coming into the hall to see the action, to look on the demo boards and be able to see what was going on. And, uh, that was sort of typical of her that she was a real perfectionist. She liked the tournaments to be just so. And so, you know, if she saw that uh, the spectators weren't having the best experience, she would uh, try to devise ways to accommodate them. And this was uh, one of her uh, innovations, uh, the, the clock system. And also another one was the projector system. And we're now moving to 1963. And if the uh, fischer ruschewski match was sort of like her uh, debut as an organizer, the uh, first Piatigorsky Cup was her uh, international big time uh, uh, time to uh, move to the front stage. And this event uh, was uh, quite unique in a couple of respects. One was that, of course, you might remember they had the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And so that what that meant was that relations between the United States and the Soviet Union were really, really poor. And there were very few uh, cultural exchanges going on at that time. But the problem for Mrs. Uh, Piedgorski, for Jacqueline, was that she really wanted to have the best players playing. And that meant she needed to have Soviet players. And so she used uh, her uh, diplomacy and that of her husband, uh, Gregor, the famous uh, cellist, Gregor Piedgorski. The two of them together 
uh, were able to persuade the Soviets with personal diplomacy to allow uh, Tigran Petrosian, who had recently won the world championship over Botvinnik, and Paul Keres, the great Estonian uh, grandmaster, for both of them to come to Los Angeles and play in this tournament. And uh, you can see some idea of the affection that the players had for uh, Jacqueline in the uh, program and w the words that they write to her. Uh, she treated them extremely well. I mean, not just in having a healthy prize fund, but making sure the playing conditions were really, really good and that uh, the places where they were staying were fine. The uh, venue for this particular tournament was the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Some of you might remember it was probably regrettably most famous for the assassination of uh, uh, Robert Kennedy. You know, it was a landmark, really, uh, you know, one of the nicest hotels in all of Los Angeles. And so that's where the players played this particular event. And her uh, planning for this tournament was really multifaceted. I mean, she didn't just want to make sure she got the best players. She had the uh, uh, best conditions for them. Uh, she wanted to make sure that the chess that was played in the tournament would be preserved for all time. So she had the idea to produce a tournament book. And that was really uh, uh, a bright idea because it definitely kept the, uh, the public's attention on the event long after it was finished. And uh, so she arranged to have Sammy Ryshevsky and uh, Isaac Cashton band together and you know, annotate all the games that were played in this tournament. And she also got individu individual contributions from some of the players. Uh, so it's a very good tournament book, but we're going to see even a better one soon enough. So here on the other side, you'll see some of the score sheets that were uh, uh, from this tournament. And nowadays, players uh, still have to keep score, but none of them do it as ni nicely and neatly as Paul Karras did. If you look at his score sheet over here, it looks like it could have been typed. I mean, he just you know had beautiful uh, handwriting, long algebraic, and uh, uh, he was a very uh, fastidious individual. I had a chance to, uh, when I was uh, just graduated from high school, I saw him playing the last tournament of his life. Uh, he died of a heart attack on his way from uh, Vancouver back to, uh, uh, to his native Estonia in uh, Helsinki Airport. But he would, at a certain point in the game, always at the same time, he would get his cup of coffee and he would put it down and he would measure out a precise amount of sugar to put in and he would put it in his cup and he would stir it and then he'd just drink a couple of drinks. And he just was very calm and just very uh, keen. And he was playing the last round against Walter Brown, who was uh, um, you know, the exact opposite, who was you know, extremely nervous and, uh, in those days. And, and it was quite interesting to see the contrast between them. So when I see the score sheet, I can think of Keres and just how uh, methodical and how uh, calm and collected he was. And, and you can see. Did it, it did, in fact, in the last game of the tournament to uh, catch up and tie for first. He had to win with the black pieces, and he was able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, in fact, the score sheet. And you can see that oftentimes when players, when things are like, you know, emotional, their score sheet will reflect that. But in his case, you know, he's just. It still stays the same. It stays the same. And you can see here also, uh, she had uh, uh, special uh, uh, tables made for the uh, Steiner Chess Club that were used in the tournament. Uh, they're using special pieces that were designed by Herman Steiner. Uh, they're very distinctive because of the very stylized knights. And uh, the uh, name placards, you know, they've maybe shown a little wear with time. But you can see that they were very nicely done as well. She really had a real sense of style and she had a real commitment to the tournament. And that meant uh, that if she showed up at the tournament and she felt the hotel staff had been, you know, not up to her standards and uh, trying to uh, make sure that everything was perfect, she would just get the old vacuum cleaner out there and she would do it herself. Now, mind you, she was uh, born into the Rothschild family, but that was, you know, she had no, nothing stopped her from doing what she thought was right, you know, to make everything just so. When I got to visit their uh, family home, I was invited uh, uh, to see all the artifacts that, that she had collected over the years. And in the, 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 the family home was quite substantial. It was on uh, uh, Bundy in West Los Angeles. And it was a wonderful family home. Uh, the, the house itself that the family lived in, it had, uh, part of it had been designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, Jr. And the, uh, the area where the, uh, uh, the chess uh, gold, if you will, was stored uh, was near her sculpting studio that uh, she became a, a very accomplished sculptor uh, in the last part of her life. And 
when I saw this at the very back of this uh, large uh, storage area that she had, I was really shocked because I'd seen pictures of it. And uh, I can't say it looked exactly like this when it first arrived here. You can imagine after 40 years, I mean, silver, uh, you know, doesn't quite sparkle the same way, but it was really nicely touched up. And uh, this is really a pretty uh, dramatic trophy to uh, award, you know. I mean, uh, there were individual uh, smaller uh, replicas of this that were given out to the winners, but this was, you know, the, the, the really the, the outstanding one. She, she spared no expenses and uh, uh, she had, you know, pretty much everything. She just wanted to do it as well as it was possible to be able to do. Now here, on the wall over here, you see a kind of a mix of two tournaments. And on the top part, you see the participants of the first Piatigorsky Cup, which was held in 1963. And on the, uh, the bottom, we moved to a new event. And that was held in 1966. And that was the, what became known as the second Piedigorsky Cup. And the venue changed from uh, the Ambassador Hotel to the uh, Miramar. And for those of you who've never been to uh, Los Angeles, it's in Santa Monica. And it's literally you know, just across the street from the beach. And it's you know, just in a beautiful location. And it's a really nice hotel. And if I had to say anything to give it the, the full uh, accolades it deserves, I could mention that uh, Bobby Fisher who uh, took second in this event, he liked the hotel so much that he just decided to stay. And he basically stayed until they asked him to leave. So he was there for an extra two weeks until somebody said, you know, uh, we'd like to invite you out for dinner. And then they packed all his stuff up and, and then, well, he, he needed to find a new home. Uh, uh, but they paid for his extra two weeks, so I think he wasn't too displeased. And you can see a picture of all the participants here, uh, except for Samuel Ruszewski in the second photo. And this second tournament, if the first was really brilliant, the second was even more exceptional. Because the first, uh, it had eight players, but the second had 10. So it was 18 rounds. It was just like the Sinkfield Cup that was held last year. It was a double round robin. And by that I mean everybody played everybody else twice, once with white and once with black. So the, that's sort of considered like the true test because uh, you know if you play uh, only once against each person, the color you get can have an influence on it. You get a white or you get a black. And, if you have 10 players and there's nine games, somebody gets an extra white or an extra black. But in this case, everybody gets the same. And everybody in this tournament uh, was like a world-class grandmaster. Donner was probably the, the weak link, but relatively speaking, uh, he was still a very, very strong grandmaster. And here uh, you had uh, Boris Spassky, the man who would, would become world champion, Bobby Fischer, the man who would become world champion, and you had the reigning champion, uh, Tigran Petrosian. Portage, Larson, uh, you know, several, uh, Nidor, Fruszewski, like players that are still well remembered today. And uh, this tournament uh, was very, very critical for the development of Bobby Fischer. He had not played any international tournaments for several years before this. And at the halfway mark of this tournament, he was next to last. And he had lost three games in a row, or as we say sometimes in chess, he had castled queenside, 0-0-0. Zero dash zero dash zero. And if he had not rallied in the second half of the tournament, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to think about what might have happened. You know, a lot of times in chess, things, you know, are, are such that history could easily have been rewritten. And in this particular case, uh, Fisher staged a violent rally and he got back to tie for first with Spassky with two rounds to go. And I'll show you a photo of them in just a moment. But here you can take in some of the action of the participants in the tournament. And what you're seeing here is uh, uh, various artifacts from the 63 tournament. And they include uh, uh, one of the posters for the event. And another is uh, you, it's hidden behind here is the program for it. And you can see there's a lot of publicity. Nowadays, there's uh, a lot of big international tournaments going on pretty much nonstop. But in 1963, that wasn't the case. And oftentimes, it could be like a half a year could go by before uh, another prominent event would uh, uh, take the stage so that the attention was really focused on these events in a way that you wouldn't see uh, 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 today. One thing I should also mention is that to put this event, uh, the 63 and 66 uh, Piatigorsky Cup, into context with uh, 
the Sinkfield Cup. And by the way, how many of you got a chance to see the Sinkfield Cup last year? Well, you know just how strong that event was. That was the strongest international tournament in the United States held since the 1966 Piatigorsky Cup. So there had been a long dry spell for American chess at the top. And these two tournaments are still on the short list of probably the five strongest tournaments ever held in the United States. And on this side, if you can gather around me here, I think this is probably the most uh, special exhibit of all the uh, ex uh, of all of them here. And uh, one of the reasons why I think that is because this picture of uh, Bobby Fischer and uh, uh, Boris Spassky, it just seems to me that it's like really kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's an overused word, but it's really like an iconic photo. Uh, you've got Fischer when he was young and, uh, uh, you know, before 19, uh, let's just say until September of 72, there was, there was the good Bobby. And then after that, there might have been like the bad Bobby for some people. So here he was when he was the good Bobby. And he just looks young and he looks happy and looks like the world's his oyster. And he's playing against Boris Spassky, who also looks very young. And he was young. And he was uh, uh, just going to become world champion a, a few years later. Uh, and the thing is, if you look at this photo, though, really closely, you'll notice there's some funny things about it. And one is that uh, it doesn't look right. And what I mean by that is that traditionally in chess tournaments, the way they do it is they allow filming for the first five minutes of the game. And then they, don't, then they stop. And the reason for that clearly isn't, especially you know, in the old days, was they didn't want the players to be distracted by flashes. And they didn't want anything to keep them from doing their best. Well, here in this picture, uh, what looks odd is if you look at the clock, no, no pieces or pawns have been moved on the board, but the clock for Fisher is already like, you know, either a half an hour or an hour and a half has elapsed. And, and Spassky's clock's also off. And you can check it by looking at the uh, clock on the far left there. That's uh, not a wall clock, it's actually Fisher's clock. So th this picture was staged. And, you know, for whatever reason, the most likely I would give is that Fisher was all throughout his career, he was uh, pretty predictable for never showing up for those first five minutes. He knew what the rules were. He knew that he wanted to take those pictures in the first five minutes, and he didn't want to have his picture taken. So he would uh, come in a little bit late and sacrifice a little time. So they said, fine. But after the game was finished, they wanted, uh, you know, they wanted to have a picture. And, and what's interesting about this is he seems to be in a remarkably good mood. He's smiling. And yet this was played in the penultimate round, and he worked really hard to get back into a tie for first. And this was really kind of a must-win game for him. If he didn't win this game, he was gonna have, knew he was going to play black in the last round against Petrosian, which would be very difficult, where Spassky had white against the tail ender Donner. So chances were, if he didn't win this particular game, that he was not going to win the tournament. In fact, that's what happened. It was a, a draw. It was a hard-fought and well-played draw, but it was a draw nonetheless. But it doesn't seem to have bothered him. I mean, he seems to be in good mood. And, uh, and you know, they both seem, it just seems like a, a picture from a different time. Now, the other things in this exhibition, one is the, the two score sheets of the two players here. And you can see that uh, uh, I would say that Spassky gets higher marks for penmanship. Uh, Bobby never kept a very neat score, but uh, it was certainly an artistic one. Uh, but to my mind, even more interesting, though, is the, uh, these papers here on the left. And what they are is a draft of the uh, uh, submission that Fisher made for the tournament book. And I mentioned the 63 tournament was pretty good, but the 66 is much better. In fact, I think the 66 tournament book is probably on my list of like the top three tournament books of all time. And the reason for that is the traditional format for a tournament book is the winner annotates his game. You know, he liked, he won, he won the game, so he's going to talk about it. The guy that lost doesn't want to even go near it. And if they drew well, they might both deign to make some comments on it, but generally speaking, the winner would annotate the games, and that would be that. Well, in this particular case, in the contract the players received, there was a condition. The condition was that all players must annotate both games. And to backtrack a moment, I should say that uh, after that 16-1 match between Fisher and Ruszewski, uh there was some bad blood uh, between uh, Bobby and, uh, and Jacqueline in the sense that uh, there had been a disagreement about the scheduling for the last game. And, uh, so for a couple years, 
Uh, they didn't cross paths. Bobby didn't play in the 63 uh, Piatkowski Cup, but uh, Jacqueline wanted to make amends. You know, he, Bobby was the best American player. He's one of the great players in the world. She wanted to have him in her tournament. So when she sent out an invitation to him, she said, you know, I not only want you to play in the tournament, I want you to write the tournament book. So that's one of those things, if only it had happened, you know, that would have been brilliant. But it didn't. But what did happen was, was arguably just as good, but, but in a different way. And that is that all the players in this tournament, with the exception of two, had to annotate every one of their games. And what that means is that on many moves, you'll have both grandmasters annotating their games. And one will say, in this position, I really like my position. It really looked good. And the other one said, I didn't understand why I didn't resign in this position. I had such a better game here. I mean, usually it wasn't quite that dramatic. But still, there could be big differences of opinion. And as a result, uh, it makes for very interesting reading to, to have insight from two strong players into the games. The two players that didn't annotate all their games, one was Donner. and he gave a pretty good effort. He annotated all but one game. And that game was such a horrible, painful loss that he couldn't bear to ever see it again in his life, as he put it. But there was one other player, of course, out of, out of the nine, nine players more or less got it right, but one other player only chose to annotate one game. And only one game because he thought he only played one good game in the tournament. And that was Bobby Fischer. And so this uh, is, is his one contribution to the tournament book. And what you see here in red, uh, pencil are his drafts to what he had already submitted before. He he had analyzed the game and he'd sent it to her. But then, being the perfectionist he was, he uh, wasn't satisfied with the final product. So he, he went over it and over again and came up with improvements and put them in. So now let's move to the back wall again and catch more action from the uh, Piatkowski Cup. And here, what you see are. Uh, uh, pictures of the participants uh, on the top from the 63 event. The, the Piatigorskis were extremely gracious to the players. They not only put them in a you know, really nice hotel, they not only made sure they had really nice playing conditions, but they also invited them to their home uh, you know, several times throughout the competitions and, and had parties for them and uh, uh, you know, really did things in a proper way. There's so many photos that Mrs. Piatigorski had from this tournament that it was impossible to include all of them formally in the exhibition. Mm -hmm.